Hi there folks that have already joined in. Uh, we're going to uh, wait just a few minutes for other folks to join us and then we will get this lecture formally started. There, Wendy. Welcome. Good. Can you hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Um, and I never asked you, is that, so is that your office? Is that your studio? That this, you're is, this is my office, yes. Okay. Um, I realize I've been staring at it all week <laughs> as we've been doing classes. And now that everybody's doing these, like, you know, their TV shows and everything from their homes, like, I'm so curious, like, what is that room? Yeah, me too. So yeah, I've noticed that too. Like it I think we're gonna um, I think we're gonna give extra credit if people can like name all my jazz albums in the uh, back. Okay, nice. The music room is the best one somehow. So <laughs> um, jazz room. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. I think we're almost set here. I'm gonna wait just thirty more seconds here to get started. Get my questions up. All right. Um, Wendy, are you feeling ready? Yeah. Great. All right. Well, I just want to welcome everyone to our Instagram live lecture with Wendy Redstar. This is our Rorick lecture on behalf of the Welland Museum of Art at Hamilton College up here in beautiful Clinton, New York. Uh, I want to start with a quick reminder um, to keep yourself safe. Um, obviously, we planned this lecture in person and we're so excited to have Wendy on campus with us. Uh, and thank you, Wendy, for being flexible and being able to join us virtually today. Um, Wendy is joining us because she is part of our current exhibition, um, which is Some Artists. Uh, that was uh, curated by Matthew Delegate and Rosanna Martinez. Uh, they own a gallery in New York City uh, called Minus Space. Uh, highly encourage you to go check that out online. Um, so shout out to our curators, Matthew and Rosanna. I um, see that they have joined us uh, for this lecture virtually as well. Um, so we want to encourage you to go to the website. Uh, you can uh, read a little bit about the exhibition, um, see some of the photos um, from the show. Um, and we want you to stay tuned to our social media channels, whether that's Facebook, Instagram. Um, we have more content that's going to be coming out in the coming weeks uh, to keep you engaged in all that we're doing at the Welland Museum. Um, and Wendy, I'm going to start off with uh, a little intro of who you are. Uh, Wendy Red Star is a Crow tribal member. You grew up on the Crow Reservation in Montana. Um, went to Montana State University for the BFA and UCLA for the MFA. Um, and I think a lot of people uh, probably think of you as a photographer, but actually your art practice is expansive. You're a sculptor, a performance artist, video artist. Um, you've done print, you've uh, done textiles. So um, I'm going to call you interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary artist. Um, and really, you know, you're, you're looking at um, your Crow heritage and how that intersects with um, all these different media in contemporary art. And currently you are living and working uh, out of Portland, Oregon. Wendy, for all of you who are tuning in, has been joining us for really for the past week, um, doing Zoom chats with our classes, um, which hasn't always been convenient for you, Wendy, because you're three hours uh, difference. You're on the West Coast there, uh, and we're on Eastern Standard Time. So thank you for being a trooper and um, hanging out with us virtually, no matter what time it is. 
Um, and the way this is going to work is uh, I have some questions for Wendy to get us started. I know you have some fabulous um, visuals to share along the way, Wendy. Um, and we do have some time at the end for your questions. So um, some of them have already come in. Some of them I know are going to be coming in during the chat. We will try to get to many, uh, as many of those as possible. So um, I want to start out with some basic context here, Wendy. As I said, um, you're a member of the Crow tribe. Um, you grew up on the reservation. You leave um, right around 18 years old. Um, go to college. I know you did have um, a year or two where you were back on the reservation helping run one of the cultural organizations there. Um, but between college and now um, living and working in Portland, um, you have lived largely off the reservation for a lot of your adult life. And I want to be very clear, you are still incredibly close with your family, with your community, your friends back on the reservation. But I, I want to start um, in terms of that distance, that geographical distance, what has that geographical distance um, now being in Portland um, done for you in terms of giving you, you know, maybe a different perspective on your culture or, or, or how has that allowed you to, to look at your culture in new ways? Um, well, first off, I, I just want to say thank you so much to the Welling uh, Museum for um, making this all happen. It's been really wonderful to engage with the students and um, the different professors over the last week, especially during this pandemic time and isolation. And also, I want to thank MindSpace for curating my work in the exhibition. Um, concerning your question, uh, it's a really great question to contemplate over the last several days, thinking about geographical distance and realizing actually it's a really, um, it's a, a, a major part of the foundation of the way that I, I work and has influenced my perspective greatly because once I left the reservation at 18 and just having like a three hour uh, distance by you know car from my reservation to where I went to undergrad, um, it opened up this new level of sort of compare and contrast of like, oh, so the diff you know, the differences in living off the reservation and on the reservation. And then from there, like, um, I just had a curiosity and a question. And so my practice really um, has this foundation of questioning. And my, one of my favorite questions is why? <laughs> so I'm constantly asking why. And I hope that, you know, when you're looking at my work, um, you know, I, I hope that the audience walks away having their own questions and that's and really encouraging them to dive in and sort of do their own research as well. So the distance has played in a major um, important part. And also, even though having that distance, I think the way that I've um, brought myself um, closer to my community is um, by making those connection points through con contemplation and through research and through having the phone calls with my dad, you know, asking him why or asking him about the language. So yeah, it's definitely a foundation for my practice and it's created this sort of third lens of vision. Would you, uh, I mean, would you almost consider your dad like a collaborator? in some of these projects. I've, I've gotten to hear you talk about him so much as a reference point uh, o over the past week. I would say 100%. Um, um, I'd say my whole community is a collaborator and um, definitely my ancestors are in collaboration with me. And then my father for sure is sort of that direct phone call that I'm always making and asking him um, questions. And um, luckily, you know, he's, willing to participate in that with me as well. That's great. I'm going to just uh, share very quickly a couple of the uh, images from the show here. I know we have Pretty Eagle right there and Two Belly, amazing story. I love all the backstories you were able to share about um, these gentlemen. Um, but again, so, uh, you know, I think, like I said, a lot of people uh, 
you know, right away are like, oh, Wendy Red Star, yeah, the photographer or whatever. But you work in so many different media. And I'm always curious when I'm talking to an interdisciplinary artist, like how how do you sort of approach a project and then decide, okay, this is definitely a photography project. Okay, this is definitely a sculpture project. Like, you know, sort of does the, you know, for you, how does the content sort of shape the medium or how does the choice of medium sort of shape the content? How do you, because you're so good at so many different media, how, how do you sort of decide um, what, what type of media you're gonna use for a certain project? Um, that's a great question. And I think initially the reason why I chose sculpture as a major in undergrad was because I felt it was a discipline that I could get away with the most in. Like I could still do ceramics if I wanted to, I could still do painting or I could maybe incorporate printmaking into it. Um, and that was at a time when like you still had to choose a major. I don't think there's, I don't think you still have to do that, um, choose a discipline. And so for me, um, I think having that background in sculpture, I'm always thinking about things in three dimension and also the thing I love about sculpture is the physical, the physicality of it, the, tact, the tactile nature. Um, and so even if I'm doing something in 2D, like a photo, there's very much like a, um, like a physical nature to it. And that maybe I've uh, sewn an entire outfit and then um, worn it and then photographed myself in it. And so there's still that physical 3D component to it. Um, but really, it's stories. So stories dictate the medium that I choose or the research um, that I gather. And from that, then that will uh, indicate, like, what is the best vehicle that I can use to best articulate this information and then share with my audience. So it really is, it really is dictated by the story or the research that's involved with the particular project. And that's how I come up with it. And that's really a, a fun part of my art practice is that decision making there. And um, when it clicks, it, it's, it's really, um, I think that's highly addicting to me <laughs> is to like find, oh, this is really gonna work in like a um, audio format, or this is gonna really um, articulate what I, what I'm trying to say through an installation, or if the viewer encounters it this way. Um, so yeah, I think it's very open-ended. Um, you know, I've, uh, I've worked in a, I've worked in a couple of different uh, museums now, and there are some days where I've been jealous of, you know, the Renaissance curator, the medieval curator, because all the artists they're working with are dead. Uh, so they're just like, all right, yeah, I want that object. And they pick it and they put it in the show. When, when we're working um, as curators with contemporary artists, I mean, you know, most of the time at the end of the day, we're not completely certain what the final product is going to look like um, from show to show. So in terms of this, you know, you being a, a interdisciplinary artist, do you have any sort of examples or, or can you talk a little bit about, you know, maybe where a curator did have an idea already in their minds, like, oh, I'm gonna work with Wendy and we're gonna do this suite of photographs or whatever, and maybe you sort of had to explain to them, like, no, I I think, you know, this really needs a sculpture. I think this is gonna be all different sorts of things. Or how, how have you sort of approached that, you know, talking to people at institutions about what's gonna be best for the show? You know, in my experience, generally, I've um, worked with lots of, um, lots of different curators that haven't really run into that problem. So I, maybe I'm fortunate that way, but the thing that has come from working with curators is there's like a real sense of uh, collaboration with them that can be um, really great for my practice and that sometimes they'll present something to me or a lot of times I see it when um, they're installing my work and sometimes with the preparator. Um, I've had some really amazing preparators who have installed my work in ways that I 
had I never really um, seen the work and it's really added a whole new dimension to that work visually. Mm -hmm. So it's more like kind of the opposite of, um, I guess maybe it's just my sort of open approach to working with institutions is just kind of really relying on some of the strengths that they, they have um, and ways that they can like, um, you know, bring new dimension and perspective to the work that I'm bringing to them. So in that way, it's been really fruitful. That, I mean, that's great. You're giving curators a nice uh, shout out there. I did not pay you to say that answer. So <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so I want to go back to something that uh, I thought was one of our most exciting conversations uh, last week with um, Rob Knight's photo class. I see in here Rob Rob has joined. Shout out to Rob's class. Um, and we got into that that idea uh, from Roland Barthes about um, you know the when you photograph someone, sometimes they cease to be a subject and they become an object. And I wanted to sort of carry that idea a little further and read something here from Susan Sontag, who says, uh, to photograph is to appropriate the thing photographed. It means putting oneself into a certain relation to the world that feels like knowledge and therefore like power. Uh, so, you know, basically she's talking about one of the conceits of photography is um, that we often think of photographs not as interpretations about the world, but as being of the world, being miniature versions of reality. Um, and I, I thought that was really relevant to your work because uh, sometimes you are creating your whole world inside the work of art, your own tableau to exist um, in. And so um, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, you when do you decide sort of, okay, I'm gonna go and document something sort of as, you know, close to truth as I can versus I'm definitely going to just invent something and I'll probably be the focal point of it. I'll be the star of this little world I'm creating. Um, sort of, you know, if you can talk a little bit about your decision-making process uh, between those two, not that they're mutually exclusive, but, but when you tend to lean more towards one than the other. Um, you know, I think initially as a younger artist, I, um, it was more out of necessity, uh, especially, you know, some of the, out of this um, necessity and also like uh, kind of um, a way for me to uh, interpret the feelings that I was having through the experiences that I was um, confronting and some of the uh, ideas that I was researching. So um, being, you know, that I was the only Crow, the only Native student in both the art departments I went to school in, um, I, was, I was the only person I could go to to um, articulate some of those ideas. So um, initially, uh, I was using myself quite a bit. So for instance, like the Four Seasons, this is a good like tableau. And um, what had happened, the inspiration behind this uh, project, which were these uh, dioramas that I built and then I posed in them wearing my traditional outfit was I had gone to the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles and out of desire to see something from my community. And initially I didn't really reflect on that thought, oh, I know where I can see some crow objects. I'll just go to the Natural History Museum until much later and realize, well, that's kind of really, um, a fucked up thing, you know, that our material culture is in there and like knowing like, oh, there's probably a high probability in Los Angeles that I could go there and see something that's crow. And I did. Um, so it was the first time that I had entered into an institution like that with sort of like this different mindset. Um, I wasn't really buying into what the institution was feeding the public. So you walked in and you walked into like, uh, a display of uh, dinosaur exhibits. You walked under this giant brontosaurus. It was really dark and dramatic. And then you walked into the galleries that house all the native objects. And I was able to find some moccasins. And in that experience, like watching the other people 
look at the native objects and me myself being a crow and realizing that these people are thinking that um, native people don't exist. We don't exist. And the institution is, uh, you know, echoing that through the way that they are exhibiting and displaying these objects. Um, and then, you know, throughout that day, you know, I was walking through the dioramas, they look like Montana. And so for me, um, I really wanted to feel that feeling, you know, and create that feeling. And so that's why this work was produced. And I brought my entire um, traditional crow elk tooth dress and all the beadwork and accessories that go with it um, to articulate what I was feeling. And then versus like work later on in my career, um, like a work that I did called uh, Where They Make the Noise, which is a, a timeline um, of an event that happens on our reservation called Crow Fair. And it started in 1904. Uh, here's some pictures of the 80s of Crow Fair. And so it, this event happened um, in 1904 as a way for the US government to assimilate crows into like a farming lifestyle. And so they modeled it after the Midwest fairs. And then the hope was that the crows would, you know, bring their cattle and their horses and their prized um, produce and they would create this fair and then therefore they would then be assimilated and turn into farmers and things like that. And they knew, the government knew that the crows wouldn't really uh, find that very exciting. So they lifted some of the bans that were happening to all native people uh, in the country at that time, which was nothing, you know, really no uh, cultural events. Um, so they lifted some of those and the crows created like uh, parades and dancing. And so I decided um, for this particular project, the best way to, you know, articulate this idea um, was to mine different archives and find as many images of crow fair throughout the decades. Um, so I started in 1904 when it started and then um, mined all of them to, uh, I think I ended in 2016, but these photos here in the 80s are all from my family's personal archive. You know, so these are my aunts, my cousins, you know, other tribal members that, you know, my mother took or my dad took. And then fast forward to like 2016, um, those are all you know, my images, you know, that I'm taking uh, with my iPhone. And um, so here's some more of these images. And so for me, um, I think, yeah, it really kind of fluctuates, it fluctuates and changes, but initially it was out of necessity. And now it's, it's more kind of driven by um, sort of the, the research and the different projects. And then, you know, like in 2016, I did do a, a series of photos called Upsalaga Feminist. And so this is sort of really talking about our matrilineal society and um, how, you know, the Crow Nation is divided into clans and then you follow your mother's clan. So I follow my grandmother and how that's, uh, the culture is passed down that way. So. This is articulating, you know, me passing this on to to my daughter. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question or not. And I mean, is it important now, you know, sort of thinking about that that tradition that your daughter has shown up in in your work in some of these um, in some of these photos or whatever that that sort of legacy is literally continuing on in your work. Yes, I, you know, she, we did have a stint where we were collaborating together. Um, she was, we started when she was seven and then she retired at age 11. Um, that was her, her idea to retire. Love it. Uh, she might come back though. And uh, um, so uh, for me, that was like, again, it was, it, it was really wonderful to work with her because she would give a lot of public talks. Uh, we worked with a lot of different museums and um, it was really wonderful to kind of sit back and have her articulate um, the research and the history and her own words and her own thoughts. 
And um, that felt really amazing that, you know, uh, she really embraced that. Um, and so, but I still feel like we're still in collaboration, especially with some of the research that I'm doing now, which is our uh, genealogy. So that's a gift that I want to pass on to her. So she knows her Absaluga genealogy. Um, and then she can do whatever she wants with that. I want to, and I, I want to get into some of this research about your culture. It seems like, you know, that was definitely not just part of the regular sort of canonized history, A, that you learned growing up in school. Um, but uh, again, with, with a, a big shout out to our, our curators, Matthew and Rosanna, I, I, one of the things I remember taking away from their tours of the exhibition when um, they came for the opening was talking about, look, the artists in this show, a lot of them are sort of playing this role of artist as researcher, artist as archivist, artist as social scientist. And so, you know, at the end of the day, yes, you are a visual artist, but I think there's something really to be said about the ways that you're filling in the historical record here. And so um, I'd, I'd like for you to, to talk, um, you know, as, as broadly or specifically as, as you want, sort of about how you've approached this research process, um, you know, both in, in terms of literally how you've gone about it and, and two, sort of what you've been able to learn about in terms of your history, including that, you know, the way that traditionally white Western society has even thought about canonizing certain types of information and the way it's, it's taught and dispersed is very different perhaps than an indigenous uh, civilization and the way that they transmit history and, and tradition to each other. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think a, a good example is to talk about the work that I did. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm handling this. Um, that is in the exhibition. So let me, let me go to that real quick. Uh, Um, so the 1880 Crow Peace Delegation, which is on exhibit. Let me just talk about this project as to answer your question. Um, sorry. So, yeah, so um, this particular project um, that is currently on display at the Welling um, started initially in 2014 as um, I was invited to have a solo exhibition at the Portland Art Museum. And around that time, there was a lot of talk about cultural appropriation, especially concerning like native designs and imagery. Uh, a lot of corporations were using them. Um, and so I was thinking about like, how does that directly relate to me and my experience? And that's when I thought about Medicine Crow. So this is Medicine Crow that you're seeing. And, um, once I left the reservation, Medicine Crow kept popping up. Like, so for instance, on the covers of books, I would see images of him randomly. Or um, when I was going to UCLA, Honest T used, here's some more images of him, used this image of him on Honest T. And so I started ask, uh, thinking about that and um, thinking about like, what does it, you know, obviously those corporations are using that image to sell their product. Um, but do they know, like, do they know anything about Medicine Crow? And then I started to ask myself, well, actually, I don't know what happened that day that he sat down. And so it was with that question that I started to um, really kind of dig into um, these images. So these images were photographed by Charles Milton Bell and that there are um, actually delegation portraits that were taken in 1880. And it wasn't just Medicine Crow here, but it was Old Crow, Two Valley, uh, Long Elk, uh, Plenty Coup, and Pretty Eagle, who also took the trip from Montana um, to Washington, DC. And so one, once I realized, oh, there's more images that are attached to this one image that is being circulated widely, um, I started digging into um, each of these, sorry, I'm gonna cruise through this, each of these um, chiefs. And what they're trying to articulate through their clothing 
um, that you might not know if, um, well, you wouldn't know. So you're presented with just the photo. And so what I decided to do was I wanted to give information um, and um, show the agency that they were trying to sh articulate through their clothing that you wouldn't know, um, which is lost. Um, so basically what they're trying to articulate is how they became a crow chief. And so there are four particular things that you have to do. So one is to like capture a, a gun or a weapon from an enemy. And that's articulated in um, this ermine that they wear on their um, war shirt. One is to um, capture uh, horses, still a horse from within an enemy camp. And so that's articulated on the ermine in their leggings. Um, they have to lead a successful war party. And so that's indicated through their like coup feathers. Or, and then the other thing they have to do is touch an enemy um, in battle. And so that's also articulated in different components in their clothing. So I would highlight those things and then also talk about each of these, this is um, Old Crow, each of these men um, um, and different things that happened in their life. So for instance, Pretty Eagle, um, he, when he passed away, his uh, remains were actually stolen and um, sent to the Natural History Museum in New York City. So his remains resided there for 72 years. And then our community was able to get him back and bury him on the Crow Reservation. And there's actually a monument called um, Pretty Eagle Point on our reservation. So it was with um, all of this research um, that I started to I myself started to learn all these different things that I didn't realize and sort of piece together um, these histories or, or, or piece together like objects in the landscape, like Pretty Eagle Point with like this particular image or this moment in history and how that related to me. So I really found it as like a, a grounding process. Um, we do have a question that just came in uh, clarifying. Any significance to the red ink? Was that, how deliberate of a choice was that maybe, or? Yeah, so, you know, I was thinking about history and uh, my experience, like in public school, I went to public school just um, in a border town called Hardin. So it was just like right about 12 miles away from the Crow Reservation. It was actually surrounded by the Crow Reservation. And um, I just remember not engaging at all with history and the way that history is being taught to me, but also through, you know, um, you know, doing homework and things like that. And then oftentimes you'd get your paperback written in red, you know, all the things that were incorrect. <laughs> and so that's, that was the thinking behind that. Like I'm, you know, writing about um, this history that isn't there. It isn't seen and um, a lot of it has been misconstrued. And so, I wanted to correct that using this red ink. And something that is wonderful is, is that there are those speech bubbles where give their name. Uh, is there, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the Crow language um, and knowing that when, even when even if the the photographer or the or the the folks responsible for taking these images wanted to put their names on these photos back in the day that that wasn't um, necessarily possible in the way that it is today because of the way the the language has changed and now it's written and things like that can you repeat that you, you cut oh off. sure just just the idea of of you know the um that the crow language you know wasn't always even a written language um, and, and that sort of what you're able to do maybe in terms of some of these annotations, especially using the Crow language, something that's much more possible now than it would have been when the photograph was taken. Yeah, I mean, um, so I think within all of the photos, I'm trying to put in as much information um, as possible. And some of that information um, also, you know, I've had other people look at it and sort of question, like, well, why did you put that in there? And the hope is like, oh, well, maybe you should Google that. <laughs> and then maybe 
like then you'll continue on the research. But in regards to like um, finding out their their uh, their pronames um, and trying to uh, you know put that information for the next person who who wants to carry on with this research. Um, that's really my hope is that another another person who is interested in this research, maybe a community member will come along and then they can use what I've done as like a reference for for their continued uh, research. But um, yeah, the Crow language was not a written language and it wasn't developed into like a written language, I believe, in the 70s. So my dad being a fluent Crow speaker, that's his first language. Um, he doesn't even know how to read Crow. And so, you know, by putting in their names um, written in the Crow language, that's just another bit of information for the next generation um, to utilize. Like this is the way that you would ha have spelled his name. Mm. Funny too. Somebody's uh, asking about Chief Bellrock. And yeah. Uh, it's awesome that you're a descendant and Bell Rock is from Pryor and that's where I grew up in Pryor, Montana. It's a town on the reservation. And um, actually I have several great photos of him and I'm happy, you know, if you want to message me privately to like send you some images or send you some information. Um, I, I want to also uh, sort of guess up get us up to the present or whatever, would you be able to talk a little bit about what your research interests are now? Um, sort of what kind of research is driving your, your current practice? Yeah, so, you know, right now I'm really interested in genealogy. So um, in our current state of um, isolation, I've been really diving into that. So like, you know, I have this whole little timeline. So this is my daughter, Beatrice, and I'm her mother. And then this is her grandfather, which is my dad. Gosh. And then from, from my dad, um, his parents are, this is my grandma, an image of my grandma. And uh, she was about Beatrice's age now, 12. And then let me find my grandpa. Where did he go? Here he is. And this is my grandpa uh, here. And so this is their child, my dad, Beatrice's grandpa. And so I've been doing the genealogy, finding, you know, um, all the information I can. And I'm utilizing Ancestry.com, which originally I was very flighty about that, joining that um, and using it. And part of the reason was because I thought like I could only go so far. I thought I could only go to my great grandparents. Um, mm. And, um, but now that I've been, this is not a pitch for ancestry.com. <laughs> <laughs> um, if they want, they should pay me for this. But um, the reason why I uh, got turned on to it is because I did a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship and I worked with the National Museum of the Med Indian, and in their collection, they have about 127 objects that are directly tied to my family. Oh, and wow. Those are uh, ceremonial objects. And so they said, oh, you know, if you know, you could possibly get, get those repatriated. And so I asked them about that process. And they said one of the ways that they verify things is through Ancestry.com. Wow. Said, what? Um, so Part of that process was maybe thinking about, you know, how I might be able to get those objects back and they would go to my dad because he's, mm. he's the oldest of his uh, generation. Um, so, but with that, then um, I was able to find amazing things. So, uh, for instance, my grandma, um, her dad is uh, Bill Dust, this guy here, so that's her dad. And then um, I don't have a picture of her mom, unfortunately. She died uh, when she was 24 of tuberculosis. So I don't have a picture of her. And my grandma was probably four years old. So she, didn't, she was raised by her grandma. But so this is her dad. And then I found his parents. So his dad is named Dust. And he is a tribal police, was a tribal police guy. And then his mom was this woman named um, Dreams the Truth or Julia Bad Bear. So it's 
sort of fun to find these images here. And so I've been really inspired by Julia. And so I've been doing projects on her. And I'll show you an image. So here are all my books. But um, there's a photographer called Fred Miller. And he photographed, he lived on the Crow Reservation. And he, he photo photographed in the late 1800s and 1900s. And so he's the one. That's Fred Miller. I also like to look at pictures of the photographers to see what they look like. So he photographed my grandma, Julia. And so this is one of his photographs. And so that's where this image is coming from. And so I've been really inspired by her. And so I've been kind of working with her, making, you know, sort of projects utilizing her here's a, like a little 3d one and then i was really interested in this tapestry of her in the background um it's some sort of blanket so i've been like selecting different blanket designs and sort of messing around with with what she would look like on some of these different tapestries and those are all pendleton uh tapestries um so yeah, so that, that's all inspired by the different genealogy work that I'm doing. Uh, it just kind of gives you a little insight into like my thought process there. <laughs> um, and there's something about, for me, that's really important about cutting those images out because it makes me, even though, you know, my grandpa passed away in 94, but like just holding him, you know, um, there's something about that that I can, I, I can actually see like things in the image that I don't see. Here's an important chief of ours whose name sits in the middle of the land. And I just realized when I cut out that he's got like an ermine on top of his head, it's like a little weasel that I never noticed when it was actually in the picture. Um, so there's an intimacy that I get from either tracing the image or cutting it out. So. Yeah, I'm really digging into my genealogy right now. I I do want to um, talk about this issue where uh, you know a lot of times this this idea though of like I said filling in the historical record. I mean, well, what we're really talking about, unfortunately, sometimes is a situation where um, there's a there's a excess burden placed upon artists of color to sort of educate you know the larger society about a history that was suppressed or ignored um, or, or degraded. Um, and, and so when you're undertaking all this research, um, which is, is um, important in a, in a broad sense historically, but also incredibly personal to you, you know, how do you sort of navigate that world of deciding, you know, what is really important to put out there in terms of information versus you know, what might be important to you, but you still want to let the project be sort of poetic rather than a history lesson, um, you know, that you want to, you want to retain, you know, some of that idea of, you know, I'm an artist, not a historian at the end of the day. How, how do you sort of navigate that? How do you, how do you take care of yourself, you know, in a, in a largely white art world still as an artist of color? Can you talk about that a little bit? You know, I think I really felt the burden of that when I was in graduate school, like really feeling like, um, like that what I, my practice and what I was doing didn't fit in and that I often felt placed in that position of educating all the time. And, um, and then after graduate school, um, I really had to kind of um, decompress from that. And I think just the older that you get, especially, especially as a person of color, you know, we all go through our own individual identity journeys. And I think the older that I get, the realize that I realize I don't really have to carry that burden. And the reason why I'm doing the work that I'm doing is because it's important to me and um, it's important to my community, regardless if it's in trend or not. So I'm not, I'm not trying to like worry myself about whether or not I fit into the art world at this point, at this stage in my life. I think as a younger artist, very much so. I, I felt a very heavy burden of that. But now I'm just like the reward of doing um, 
all of this research for me far outweighs any of those kind of concerns. I just want to follow that thread because we have a, a question that just came in about, is there certain information that you do feel like that is something we keep within our community versus sharing that very broadly? Um, yeah. And so, you know, anything that I do, do, I think a lot of um, Native artists do run up against this and do, do think about that. And I think it's an experience that we all kind of share as um, Native artists. Um, so any, anything that I find that is just off limits, uh, I definitely won't do, um, for sure. Um, but it's also interesting too, I think a lot, I think also that kind of thinking too, I think really comes um, from, yeah, just living in a colonial society and, you know, the way that Native people have, anthropologists have uh, dug into the community and to our objects and the way that our objects have been collected in institutions you know, there's uh, the way that that has impacted like my generation uh, and the way that we think about our own materials, I think is quite different than um, maybe the way that my ancestors thought about some of their materials. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's, there's definitely that sort of pressure. But I think also doing research the way that I do, a lot of these preconceived notions that I have um, or maybe a lot of these tight boundaries that I've made up of what like a crow person is or what crow culture is, has been dismantled when I look into archives or I look into collections and I realize, oh, wait a minute, you know, um, this guy here, you know, he was married to a Lakota woman and um, there's a delegation portrait of him in 1873, along with other Crow members, and most of them are wearing Cheyenne or Lakota moccasins. Mm. And that's something for me growing up, I thought, no way, they would just be wearing Crow moccasins. And realizing that it's so much more um, fluid um, and not so, like, there weren't these tight restrictions that I've made up in my mind as, like, a pureness of what a Saliga means and what the culture means was so much more fluid and open so you're you're reveling more and more in the gray area sounds yeah. like as we move on Definitely. in your research um so uh there's a couple other questions that have come in here um that i want to get to um one you know i was just talking about you know taking care of yourself and everything and of course we don't want to um ignore the fact uh, that we are in the middle of a pandemic. Are there things that you're doing during this time to take care of yourself? Are, are there thoughts that you have to share with other artists who obviously are, are going through this pandemic at the same time with us? Yeah, I mean, it's a scary time, especially if you're a self-employed individual if, um, as an artist. But I think also artists are really good in situations like this as well. Um, and we tend to be survivalists. And so I, th I think, you know, even though these times are really scary and difficult, I do think like as an artist and the fact that one of our tools is creative problem solving, I think that's really gonna aid us during this time to figure out different solutions or even the fact that I get to do this lecture with you virtually. I, I think there are ways that through our creative thinking that we'll be able to, you know, make the best of this situation. Um, I think the way that I'm approaching this time is just really digging into things that, you know, my travel would disrupt, like having time to finish looking at different books or having time to uh, look at digital archives. Um, I'm currently editing um, the fall issue for Aperture Magazine. So th that is, this has provided me a lot of focus time to actually reach out to other photographers, other native artists and uh, have like Skype sessions or Zoom sessions with them. So um, that's one of the ways that I'm sort of um, getting through this time and, and opening up discussions and connecting to people. Yeah, I was, talk I was talking to another artist on the phone um, uh, last week, and he was trying to, to keep a really, you know, 
positive outlook and said, I'm just treating this like a residency inside my home, basically. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, a good way to look at it. Um, so uh, the Welland Museum of Art, of course, we are located on the beautiful campus of Hamilton College. Uh, and we have uh, some wonderful art students, um, young artists. And um, so uh, this makes sense that we got this question. Um, what uh, might be some advice that you do have for um, young artists today in terms of how, how to approach finding your artistic voice, um, which I, I think is a great question for you um, because you, I've been able to listen to you uh, over some of these class visits talk about, you know, straddling multiple worlds at one time or, you know, listening maybe to what your professor tells you is important versus what you are really, you know, interested in exploring in your art. Um, you know, do you have some stories or some advice, you know, from your past that you can share with our young artists? Um, gosh, I think, I think as a young artist, just really to experiment as much as possible, I think is so important. And I think I remember rolling my eyes when people would tell me that <laughs> at a, uh, when I was like in school. But I think it's so important. There's something I, I think about my time in undergrad where I didn't really know much about contemporary art or art history. And there was just sort of this very um, energetic, naive approach to making work that was really exciting and the further I got into it um, the, the more I would talk myself out of like experimenting and trying ideas for fear of you know getting critiqued or whatever so I do think like if you have the time um, to really utilize that to try every idea that comes into your head because that's the only way that you're going to be able to like um, experience and learn from from that project and maybe that will become the foundation of your practice later on so i that would be my advice and then the other thing too for me that i think is would have been really important for me to hear is um that you know that time that you're like watching netflix or the time that you're out um of your studio is also part of your practice and to just really embrace that and not to um, feel that pressure of maybe there's a student who is constantly in their studio and just making work in their studio and being praised for that. My time a lot uh, when I was in graduate school was to go to different thrift stores and like look at different objects and things like that. And I always felt kind of bad about it that, you know, it seemed maybe I was wasting time and I should have been in the studio, but actually that experience of kind of going out really informed my practice. And now, you know, today I spend a lot of time walking. Um, there's a park here called Forest Park in Portland. And that is such an important part of how I um, create work because I work out all my ideas by, you know, taking a daily walk. And so I, I really wish someone would have said, yes, that, that's an important way um, and part of your practice and it counts. Um, I want to, I want to flip that just a little bit, um, in terms of if you have anything that sort of you, you'd like to put out there for the faculty, uh, either art faculty or, um, uh, native cultures, uh, faculty in terms of, you know, sort of how you hope things are changing or, or steering in new directions versus when you were in art school. I think, you know, especially as a Native artist, I think um, there are so many um, more um, Native artists being brought into these cultural institutions than there was, there was like maybe like a handful, especially here in the U.S. Canada is a whole different story. I feel yeah. like light years ahead of us, especially with their First Nations uh, uh, contemporary art. It's a whole different story. But um yeah, so when I was an undergrad, um, I think the first time I saw work, a contemporary work by a Native artist, wasn't until graduate school, and I was um, desperate for it. So I was really excited to see it, it was uh, Rebecca Belmore, and, um, and I think then James Luna also. So now I'm seeing that there are a lot more Native artists here, especially in the States, that are 
being brought into institutions like the last Whitney, there were so many Native artists that were included in that. And that's just like, that's new. That's just a, a new thing. And it's really exciting to see that. So I would say, please invite more Indigenous artists to do lectures like this and include them in your curriculum as much as possible. Yeah, well, it, 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 I, I love that you're um, giving a shout out to uh, our neighbor to the north there. Uh, you know, I think you look at a lot of institutions in Canada, you know, the AGO, they uh, replaced their retired um, Art of Canada curator with two people, um, both women and one of them an Indigenous person. And, you know, that changes fundamentally the outlook on how you curate the art of Canada for your galleries, I think. Um, so um, I'm definitely on board with you that I think we could learn a few things from how Canada's art scene is embracing um, their indigenous heritage. Um, couple uh, more questions that have come in here. I know we are um, rapidly running out of time. Um, so I want to go back to, um, some uh, th this idea that um, you do have a little bit of humor sometimes that uh, you infuse in your work and you, you are dealing with some very serious issues, issues um, some critically important parts of history. Um, and yet sometimes there's, there's, there's this wonderful um, bit of humor that comes across. And can you talk a little bit about how you approach that, about how imbuing when you decide there's a good like, moment there uh, to put some humor in the work? Um. Personally, I think everything, I think I'm hilarious. I know um, maybe people don't agree with me, <laughs> but um, I often find myself like cracking up um, of my own thoughts all the time. And I think that just naturally that comes up in the work. And I would say anytime you're looking at my work, there's a, a bit of humor in everything, even if there's something that um, you think is serious there was probably a humorous thought that was happening. Um, so it's just the way that I was raised and in the community, especially Crow community, uh, and a lot of different native communities, we are funny. We're really funny and we kind of really go after each other. Um, and so I'm sort of just used to communicating in that way where it's uh, sort of about like, you know, lightheartedness to crack some of that serious tension um, that, you know, a lot of the subjects that I'm talking about, it's a way to kind of heal from them too. So I really, um, utilize it that way, but it's never like I'm intentionally set out to make something funny. It just happens, you know, to come up in the process. Um, and, um, I think, I think humor is so important and I'd love, you know, any artist who utilizes it, I'm immediately drawn to their work. <laughs> 